I have been asked to pull a talk out of the archives, a talk that I used to give fairly regularly back in the old days of NSA. That was back in the, uh, the days when the students needed to be reminded more often than you do not to be a fathead. <laughs> so the nickname this talk acquired was the Fathead Talk. But on the other, other side, since then, since the days I used to give this talk, I've acquired quite a bit of new material. Over the <laughs> and so I was happy to comply. Now, there's a lot to fit in here, and so the points are somewhat condensed. And that I want to condense them, and I want to leave some time for Q&A. And in the Q&A, so you don't have to say it, please know that we're all assuming that you're asking for a friend. <laughs> All right, so I get, to, I get to put a lot into this talk. The downside is that for you, this is going to be somewhat like eating lemonade concentrate out of a can with a spoon. The backdrop of this talk is my assumption that you are worshiping the Lord regularly on the Lord's Day, and that you are hearing the gospel of grace proclaimed, and that you are invited to the Lord's table every week, where God uh, assures you of the fact that you are accepted in the beloved, you are in fellowship with him. That backdrop of grace is really important and is going to make all the difference in how you hear this talk. Without it, without that backdrop of grace, without a worshiping community, without your knowledge that God has accepted you, uh, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Without that, this talk will be nothing but law. Thou shalt not be a fathead. With that backdrop, this talk is overflowing with good news. You don't have to be a fathead. That's good news. No. You might say, yeah, but that presupposes the bad news that I'm being one. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so here's our text. This is from Titus. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live, and here the italicized words, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So, the Christian faith is, among many other things, morally serious. This does not mean that a long face is mandatory. That is not what is meant here by serious. But if you have a tendency to dismiss as a legalist anyone who loves Jesus more than you do, then this talk is for you. The things I wish to address here come in no particular order. I didn't even make an effort to alphabetize them. I just put down these things that I wanted to touch on, things that are common temptations for you in this town, in this circumstance, in this college, with your likely background. The first thing is foreign relations regarding the U of I and WSU. Foreign relations with regard to your fellow college students in uh, these two college towns, the U of I and WSU. Now, at some point, if it hasn't already, it will dawn on you just exactly how much work we are making you do. There are many ways for this to get tangled up, and one of them is to not actually do the work that we're making you do, but that's another topic. Enough about your grades. The point here is for those of you, the point I want to make under this heading, is for those of you who are doing the work that we are making you do. I want to exhort you to be particularly humble when it comes to your interactions with other college students in the area. Now, you've probably been in conversations where there's bad weirdness or an awkward, awkward juju moments. When, and when they arise from you, they come from two sources, which would either be simple conceit, pride and arrogance, we're better than the world, we're better than everybody, we're the smart people in the room. That's conceit, uh, that conceit and arrogance, that would be one problem. And the other would be insecurity. All right, so people, people boast for two reasons. One is because they really believe it, and the other is because they don't really believe it. They, they really believe that they're better than everyone else, and they boast, consequently, that's arrogance. The other is that they're insecure, and so they have to remind themselves all the time that they're not going to a toy college um, 
the, the people across the way that are learning mechanical engineering, uh, you looked at one of those textbooks once and it made you cry. Uh, <laughs> And then, and then you get to come to this college where you get to read the kind of books that you've loved for a long time. Sometimes you can feel like, I'm not really, uh, is this for real? Is it, am, I do, am, am I really getting an education? That would be insecurity. But however it falls out, whether it's driven by arrogance or by insecurity, Proverbs 27.2 says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth a stranger, and not thine own lips. So we have our convictions about what Christian higher education should be, what higher education should be like. Uh, we have decided views on the elective system that the modern university has. We have pronounced Christian worldview uh, convictions on the impossibility of secularism in education. It's a pre Secularism is a pretense. So we believe all of those things. At the same time, when you meet a Christian who's an engineering student or an ag econ student, or some, you, know, you meet a Christian at CRF or somewhere who is uh, pursuing another track, led by the Lord in a different direction than you're pursuing, your task is to honor them. Your task is to look up to them. Your task is not to see, not to, do not steer the, the conversation in such a way as you say, well, um, enough, of, enough about me talking about me. Why don't you talk about me? That's, <laughs> that's not the way it goes. The, the, the way it should go is you should uh, consider others, as the apostle says, consider others better than yourself. Put the other person's interests ahead of your own. Put the other person's accomplishments ahead of your own. And if you think, well, I don't, you know, I, I think I've done a lot and I'm not sure that their major is quite as challenging as what I'm doing, your, your task is still to consider what they're doing as more important than what you're doing. And this is um, a, f a fundamental Christian demeanor. So when you're dealing with U of I students and WSU students, they should not be walking away with the impression that you are a stuck-up lot. All right? if, you, if you are reading theology and studying Christian worldview thinking and reading the Bible and singing the Psalms and memorizing a bunch of Psalms, uh, the end result of that ought not to be conceit. The end result of that ought to be humility. So, foreign relations, U of I, WSU. The second thing is Christian liberty. Christian liberty. There is such a thing as Christian liberty when it comes to things like alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Now, for you international students, it's our contention that the ATF ought not to be a federal agency, but rather the name of a convenience store. <laughs> so we have nothing against alcohol, nothing against tobacco, and nothing against firearms. So we intend to continue to fight for true Christian liberty, despite how diligently fools like to disregard the Apostle Paul. Let not then your good, let not then your good be evil spoken of. That's Romans 14, 6. Don't, don't uh, swing your liberty around on the end of a rope. If you swing your liberty around on the end of the rope and you clock somebody, the problem is not their misunderstanding of liberty. The problem is your misunderstanding of liberty. So this actually, this, this component, the Christian liberty component, was the centerpiece or the thrust of the proverbial uh, fathead talk and was the reason for it. When it comes to this kind of thing, the college is not going to give you a list of detailed and explicit directions. One of the reasons why uh, we have a system where we don't have dormitories, where we, you all board with families or you have apartments. One of the reasons we don't want to build a dormitory system is if you have a Christian college and a dormitory system and a bunch of 18 to 22 year olds, there's no way for a college to do that without stepping into the role of mom and dad. And, uh, and that means we start to dictate things that we shouldn't be dictating. Instead, you're, o you're old enough to learn the principle. We don't want to hold your hand but we do want you to learn the principle. So, what do we do? We're not gonna give you explicit directions as though, we're your mom, as though we were your mom, but we are willing to tell you not to embarrass the cause of the gospel. Don't embarrass the cause of the gospel. Don't embarrass the college. Don't embarrass your family. But how is it, how is it possible for me to do that? Well, 
If you're drinking beer at 2 in the morning and somebody calls the cops in your apartment complex because of the loudness of the music, the issue is not whether uh, everybody in the apartment had just had one beer. That's not the issue. The issue is you're, you're swinging your liberty around on the end of a rope. Don't do that. And you say, well, uh, what, if, what if I go to church and they serve me communion wine? Drink it. <laughs> if, I go to, if I'm invited to a, a, a respectable family in the community and I, I go to their Sabbath dinner and I sit down and there's a glass of wine, we toast the arrival of the Lord's Day. What do I do? Drink it. Use your head, right? Just use your head. Don't want to put too much of a burden on you, but use your head. <laughs> now, I'm, I might, might add a little bit further that some of you are waiting to hear this talk for the fifth time before doing anything about it. Uh, the way of a fool, it says in Proverbs twelve fifteen, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So don't abuse your Christian liberty. Christian liberty is not something, I'm, I'm not saying Christian liberty is great and now watch me squelch it. What I'm saying is Christian liberty is great, don't you squelch it, don't you abuse it, don't you run, into the, uh, run it off the road. Number three, I've titled this one Artsy Fartsy. You have no business you have no business watching any movies that your great-grandmother would have dismissed, and I quote her, as filth. And she was quite upset about it. <laughs> if, you found, if you found a chiastic structure in Kill Bill 17, that just proves that you're a chump with too much time on your hands, and not that you were a deep reader of fat biblical theology books. Don't spend inane amounts of time on all the latest digital time wasters. Every six months, there's another digital time waster that's invented and rolled out. Um, don't, just don't. Here's the, here's the litmus test. If after an evening of doing whatever it was you were doing with your gang, and one of the gang, one of the guests, for some reason, suggests that you top it all off with a psalm and a prayer, and all you feel like doing is shuffling your feet in an embarrassed fashion, then you have this problem. Some things don't top off with a psalm and a prayer, if you know what I mean. Some things do. Some things don't. If you, if you just finished watching the tawdriest movie you ever saw, and then you click it off and somebody says, how about we sing a psalm? <laughs> Somebody's going to say, should have sung it earlier. <laughs> All right? Liter literary, dis literary discussion is not an all-purpose disinfectant. You don't, you don't get to clean things up by furrowing your brow at it. Um, ooh, this is, look, we just watched Dawn of the Dead, and it has death and resurrection themes. <laughs> if there's one place where I think NSA is really challenged, uh, is, it, is really, uh, it, it, it is really an uphill climb for us. This is a challenge. How can we communicate what worldview thinking means in a practical way. If, and the challenge is applying that or pushing that into the field of entertainment standards or the lack of them. Entertainment standards or the lack of them. If the only thing that was reviewed on the Day of Judgment, this is not going to happen, this is bad theology, just a thought experiment. If the only thing that was reviewed on the Day of Judgment was your Spotify playlist, and your Netflix queue, how would you fare? Would you land in Dante's second circle? <laughs> you say, by the, um, good thing you're not going to be reviewed on those two things alone. But if that were the case, how would you fare? And by the way, having spoken of Netflix queue, I can't pass, uh, pass by my use of the word queue without pointing out that it is the letter Q followed by four silent letters. But that would take us far afield. <laughs> so don't, don't assume that Christian worldview thinking or being a reformed egghead, being, being reformed and having a reformed world and life view means that you get to watch movies you oughtn't watch. 
it doesn't mean that you get to watch dirty movies and pretend that they weren't. Uh, don't, don't kid yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to your roommate. Don't, just don't. Heads up. Here's another one. Some of you are already aware of this in varying degrees, but all of you need to know that we are, we here in Moscow, are currently in another season of my adversaries, honing their arguments against what we are doing in this community by pelting me, and now, as of a few days ago, my wife, with dead cats, grapefruit rinds, old lettuce leaves, and other detritus scraped off the bottom of a dumpster. The, this, happen, this comes in waves, it, it comes and goes, there have been a number of um, uh, episodes where this happens, and we're in the middle of one now. So, you might find yourself in a conversation with a local, and when he finds out that you go to NSA, he says something like, NSA, eh? Doug Wilson, huh? I hear he sells meth to the elementary kids at Lena Whitmore. <laughs> Do not feel an obligation to refute it. <laughs> I don't want any emails, but is it true? <laughs> I would like to encourage you to pay no attention to the yelling of desperate men. But for those who are not careful and find themselves entertaining suspicious thoughts, on the supposition that vehemence equals veracity, I can only express relief that someone of such capacity is thinking about joining the other side. So 1 Timothy 5.19 requires that charges against elders be rejected without independent confirmation. 1 Timothy 5.19, if someone were to accuse me of shoplifting at Tri-State and they have three witnesses along with footage from the security camera, I think the Bible is clear. I think you and the elders and everybody should take it seriously, unless it's a deep fake video. But, that, <laughs> but if someone asserts it, if someone asserts something like that because aliens left a message to this effect on their answering machine, the issue is not whether or not I think that I am sinless or have never made a mistake. I would want to go back to the aliens part. <laughs> scriptures, teach us very pl scriptures teach us very plainly that it can be a sin to listen to lies and not just to tell them. That's Proverbs 17.4. It's a sin to listen to lies. It's, it's obviously a breach of the ninth commandment to tell a lie, but it's a sin to listen to them, to give heed to them. Now, for some of you, and I know this to be the case, for some of you, this is a more challenging topic because you can just avoid the weirdo on the street who stopped you and said, where do you go to college? You can just steer, steer clear of that guy. But some of you, it's more challenging because you get questions from family members, your very worried Aunt Millie, who sent you some websites before you came here in the first place, and some of it might well come up at Thanksgiving dinner just next week. So you're, brace, you're bracing yourself for awkward Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner conversations. And what do you do? Do, I have to, do you have to feel a need to answer everything or chase every rumor? Uh, the, best, the, the, the best thing for you to do and the best refutation and answer for all the folks back home will be found in the quality of the honor and affection that you show to them. That is going to answer the bulk of the objections. When someone, when someone joins a cult, one of the first things the cult does is separate, try to separate them from all their former friends, their former associates. They try to separate them from their family. They try to isolate them. That's, that's, what, how, that's the central MO of a cult. And what we want to do is encourage you to go in precisely the opposite direction. There are people who know you who, those of you who are in this position, there are people who are fearful that you have joined a cult or your parents are thinking of joining a cult and what about the cult and what about the Kirker cult and all, all of that. The best thing you can do that is going to really disrupt that narrative is to love and honor the people back home. All right, if, you go, if you go home prepared to serve, prepared to give, prepared to be interested in other people to, and not be full of yourself and going back to the the top, not being boastful or arrogant or conceited, uh, that's going to settle a lot of things down. All right, next. Fellowship of the Grievance. Fellowship of the Grievance. Closer to home, we have a phenomenon that I call, I call the Fellowship of the Grievance, uh, FOG or FOG, usually within the camp and usually composed 
of males who've done poorly in their classes or poorly in a courtship or poorly in both. <laughs> That's a bad half year, right? <laughs> They decide that the problem is, is with the ever nefarious them. Right? It's, it's easy to blame shift and push it off on others, either circumstances or the providence of God or the faculty or the people who are unfair. Um, but, but be aware of the fact that grumblers seek one another out. And I call, it, I call this the fellowship of the grievance because what happens is... One person can have grievance A, and another person grievance B, and another per person grievance C, and grievance A and grievance C can even be contradictory. They can be on opposite sides, but provided they're a grievance against the establishment, against the college, against the school, uh, these people find each other. They, they start talking to each other. I remember, I remember uh, one time, a number of years ago, where one person left the church because of another person in the church who was, it was musical grievance, musical grievance. One person left the church over music, and then a short time later, the person responsible for the music that this person was upset about, they left the church over, with another grievance. But those two people found each other and found themselves in fellowship. Even though they had mutually exclusive grievances, they both had a grievance. And that was the bond of fellowship. You never, ever want your bond of fellowship or your bond of unity or, your, or your, the bond of friendship to be a complaint or a groan or a moan. Uh, you just don't want to be that kind of, that kind of person. Uh, with that kind of person, the penalty or the, the chastisement that is visited upon them is that they have to be the kind of person they're becoming. And you don't want to become, you don't want to be in the process of becoming that kind of grumbler. Because grumblers eventually turn into grumbles. Then, the last point, and then I'll sum up all of them. It, spiritual pride. Spiritual pride. If the church you are going to, and we've got a number of church services, um, CREC churches, and then there are other evangelical churches in the area that some of you go to. Most of you are in a CREC uh, congregation, and there are differences between these congregations, differences between these churches. If the church you are going to is vastly superior to the one your roommate is going to, and you are very aware of that fact, then you have a problem with spiritual pride. Okay, If, you're, if your roommate... Now, here, let me back up. Uh, some of you choose which church to go to, whether it's Christ Church or Trinity or, or King's Cross. Uh, you, uh, where you go to church is a function of which roommate owns a car. <laughs> so that's, that's just a logistical, practical sort of thing. But if you're going to different churches, if everybody has a car and you're going to different churches and you... Uh, look down on, you're very aware of the differences, and you take pride in those differences in an I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos sort of way, you have a problem with spiritual pride. This superiority can be manifested in all kinds of ways through how big a church is or how small it is, the altitude of the liturgy or the quality of the music. You can, you can grab onto something and be proud of it. Boil it all down, and if after two terms of worshiping there, you don't love Christ and your neighbor more, then you really ought to save your breath for cooling your oatmeal. You're, you are like the person who takes pride in the fact that he buys all his medications at Walgreens when they are medications he never actually takes. He buys the pills, and he lines them up in the medicine cabinet, and he takes great, he's feeling superior to the person who buys his uh, pills and prescriptions elsewhere, um, but he doesn't take them. God provides us with means of grace. God provides us with means of grace, the word, sacraments, prayer, and so on. But we ought, we ought not to act as though he has provided us with the props of grace. God provides us with means of grace, not the props of grace. A crowd around us that somehow keeps us somewhat vertical, even though we have gone spiritually limp. If you've gone spiritually limp, but you're still upright because you're around other people who are upright, that is, uh, that's peer pressure. That's not, the, that's not the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's not, Christian, that's not even Christian community. So, 
In sum, wrapping all of this up, first, don't be haughty with people who are getting their education elsewhere. Don't be haughty with people who are getting their education elsewhere. Second, don't abuse your Christian liberty. Your Christian liberty is precious. Your Christian liberty ought to be a a thing of great value to you, and you do, do not want your good thing to be spoken of evilly. So don't abuse your Christian liberty. Third, don't try to sprinkle the hooba dust of Christian worldview thinking over the top of things you shouldn't be watching in the first place. You can't just sanctify it by saying, I, I have a world, I, I'm doing a worldview analysis. Fourth, don't believe lies on the internet about the community that you know better than they do. Don't believe lies on the internet about a community that you live in and they don't. Don't believe lies about uh, things that you, you know, you don't want to... Uh, you don't want to uh, give credence to someone who, from 3,000 miles away, says to you, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? So, fifth, don't cluster together with other people on the basis of a similar complaining spirit. Don't cluster together with other people who whine. And then last, your church is supplying you with your spiritual meals. Eat them and don't play with them. Eat, eat your food, eat your meal, don't play with your food. Thank you. Time for a Q&A, and I thought I would get it started with one question. I'll pitch you one question, Pastor Doug, and then, um, then raise your hand, ask your question. I'll repeat your question for the microphone, and uh, we'll fire away here. So on the grumbling portion, I had a question about what what if you um, run into another student? If you're a student at NSA, you run into another student, you're talking, and you have like kind of a moderate, mild grumble from that student. So it's not a full raging grumble fire, but it's mild grumbling. Um, What do you recommend? It would depend on the nature of the grumble. If it's about the weather, um, God's in charge of that. So you just say, well, let's just thank the Lord for that, for the rain or the cold or whatever. Let's just thank the Lord for it right now and just confront it with them. If it's a grumble about a roommate or uh, you know, some snar- relationship snarl, what you need to do is say, well, you have a pr- they said this about you and you, that's what happened? And they say, yeah. Then you should take them by the hand and say, well, let's go talk to them right now. Now, that will do one of two things. Either you're going to help them go to the person and resolve it, or they will quit talking to people like you. (laughs) Very good. All right. Raise your hand. We'll call on you. We've talked about before is that every healthy institution has people that are both committed to it and also um, are committed to improving it or not letting it fall apart. could you speak to knowing which side of that you're on, balancing between those, what that looks like? Every institution has friends and foes, and how do you deal with that situation? No, that, so, so I, uh, every, every institution has people in it who are loyal to the institution, but also see areas where it needs improvement. And how do you navigate that? Is that um, so my my best example of this is uh, Trumpkin in uh, Prince Caspian, where uh, there are two two episodes there. One is where, uh, if you know the story, and you, if you don't, you're in sin. But if you, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Trumpkin, after uh, Doctor Cornelius says that we're going to blow the horn and we call up help from the high past or Aslan will come. And then it's decided, well, we need to send two messengers to some of the ancient places where the help might come. And Trump can object, well, now we're losing two good fighters. And then someone else uh, challenges the Prince Caspian. And then Trump can volunteers. He doesn't believe in the horn at all, but he volunteers to go. And it said, in surprise, Trumpkin, I thought you didn't believe in the horn. And he says, no more I do, your majesty, but I know the difference between giving advice and taking orders. You've had my advice, and now's the time for orders. 
So if basically you can have your discussion, you can give your perspective, you have your disagreement, but then the decision is made and you're all in. All right? if, you're, if you're loyal to that uh, institution, you're all in once the decision is made. But then also in Prince Caspian, uh, someone suggests bringing in the ogres and hags and evil critters from up the, up the way. And one of the animals objects, I think it's Truffle Hunter, objects and says, um, we would forfeit Aslan's help if we did that. And Trumpkin says, oh, Aslan. He said, what, what matters much more is you wouldn't have me. In other words, if you brought those guys in, I'm down the road. So if it gets to the threshold of a fundamental moral issue, then, and you, and you, can't, you can't compromise, then leave. You just be done. But if it's simply a matter of disagreement, then you express your disagreement like Trumpkin did, but then when the decision is made and it goes against your preferred wishes, you do your level best to make it succeed. Another question? So you, Pastor Wilson, have been accused of 20 things that are false, and I imagine that if we continue to change culture, we will be accused of many things that are also false. My question to you is, when is it time for an apology when is the time for an explanation? And when is the time to admit that we're wrong? When accusations come, false accusations come, when is it time for an apology, an explanation, and when it's time to admit we're wrong? Okay. So um, the, there's a rubric, a basic uh, pattern that I, that I work through. One is, do you even address it at all? So if a, if a crazy accusation floats by in my Twitter feed, and I click on the, on the profile, and uh, the guy has seven followers. And I figure, mom, three sisters. Uh, yeah. um, what I do is I just, huh, the world's an interesting place, and I just sail on merrily. I don't, I don't bother with it. I don't give it the time of day. It, uh, then there are the situations where uh, someone says something, brings something up, or you discover in the middle of a controversy, you discover that you said something erroneous, it was wrong as a matter of fact, or you responded poorly, um, and the God thinks that you owe an apology. So you apologize when God thinks you owe one, when God requires it, when God's word requires it. So let's say someone attacked me for something, and I answered uh, quickly, and I got the year wrong, and I got the person, I, you know, let's say I got a, a number of facts wrong, and then I discover that the next day, let's say, I have a responsibility to correct the record in as public a way as I made the mistake. All right, so I have a tag, uh, I have a tag on my blog that is called retractions. So there's a whole, and probably by the time I'm done, they can make a book out of them. Uh, there, there are a number of things where that was wrong. I misjudged, you know, misjudged the call here and here and here. Um, then there are. Then there's the third category where you answer them, and that is where the person is making a substantive accusation. You check on the profile, and they've got thirteen thousand followers. If I answer the guy with seven followers, I've just made his day. Right. If I answer him, I just handed him the microphone. Here. And so, but if I answer a guy who's got 13,000 followers, he just made my day. Right? So all of a sudden, I've got a microphone, and I've, I, I get to talk to people about uh, what's going on. Some of you, a bunch of you probably know about this, but a couple of days ago, someone fished out an old clip of a mini-conference on parenting we did, and they snipped out a, like a two-minute version of Nancy, uh, my wife, answering a question about child rearing and a situation in which she spanked our, uh, Rachel was probably three years old, and she was spanked for a, uh, an attitudinal problem. And that was put on um, online, and it rocketed up. Like Last time I checked, it was just shy of three million views. So that's something you want to answer. Um, if, someone, if someone does that, well, then they've just given us a microphone. So uh, we answer it. So if it's uh, not worth our time, 
because the person is just making noise and is trying to get into the spotlight, don't answer at all. If, if you actually owe an apology, they shouldn't have to demand it. You should be eager to put things right on your own. And then if they have a substantive audience uh, and it's, there's something there to answer, uh, you want to refute them, then you refute them. So also, I'll finish with this on my blog, uh, in the top menu under About, if you click on About, there's a, uh, an option called Controversy Library. And you can go there and click on Controversy Library. And there are timelines, elder minutes, responses to all the major objections that um, you're likely, if, if you've heard someone throw something at us, there's an answer to that probably uh, in that Controversy Library. Another question? So is there anything inherent in the term fathead that differentiates it from the fool described in the book of Proverbs? No. <laughs> so so uh, any number of terms could serve. Chucklehead, chowderhead, meathead, fathead. Um, Nabal, who was married to Abigail, the beautiful, intelligent woman, his name, Nabal, actually means something like blockhead. Um, so it's, yes, it's, and in the Bible, um, fathead or fool is a, it's not an IQ thing. It is a moral thing. So fatheadedness is folly, moral folly, not um, someone who had, you know, struggled with calculus. When we explain to other people what the Uncompromising um, with our response and explaining the true virtues and values of it without being um, insensitive or dishonoring to the other person. I would say the best way to put the. To, I think it was probably called on the mics. Okay, so I would say the best way to do something like that is to just simply couch it in terms of a personal testimony anecdote. Um, instead of in a personal conversation, you don't have to tell that person what the best education for North America is <laughs> and, and what we should do with all these colleges that are churning out nonsense. You don't have to go big. You simply have to say, uh, the way I was brought up and the way I was taught and my, uh, my inclinations and love of reading, this was really a right fit for me. And that is awfully hard to argue with. Right, because the, then you're, pu you're putting the person, if the person wanted to argue with it, they have to come into your life and the burden of proof would be on them that the stuff you're studying isn't wholesome and good and valuable for you. All right? if you I think it is appropriate for you, us to talk about the higher education in North America at the right level. If, that's, if we're having a debate about that, then we're talking in third person terms. But if you're just talk, chatting with someone after church or talking to someone about why you made the choice you did. Just tell them why you made the choice you did. You talked about friends coming to you grumbling about other people. What about when we're at school and friends are coming to us grumbling about either a professor or schoolwork that they've been assigned? Do we do the same thing and say, let's go to their office right now? And <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, this is definitely the asking for a friend, but this friend is not even at NSA. This friend's at another college. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because there could be no conceivable problem with anything that an NSA instructor ever did. Uh, exactly. So, so basically the best, I, I can't tell you how many times um, a problem, a snarl between Christians developed because something bad happened and then we leapt to jump to conclusions. Uh, we jumped to impute motives. Well, they did this because they knew that I was, you know, they, they were trying to get back at me or you just assign motives, things you don't know. And the bad news might be bad news enough, like the, the day the uh, paper is due. Th that might be objective bad news. But then you assume that, let's say, the instructor didn't know all that you were dealing with or, the, or did know everything you were dealing with and assigned it anyway and that sort of thing. If your friend is complaining to you about that sort of thing, say, listen, um, it's office hours. Why don't I, I'm happy to go with you to ask, ask him what the story is. 
and ask, don't accuse. This is the other thing. When you, when you walk into a conversation with roommate, with close friend, with an instructor, and it's a tense situation, an awkward or a tense situation, always start by asking questions. Don't start by making assertions. Don't go in and say, why did you do this awful thing? And then have to walk it back when you discover they didn't do the awful thing. Um, you need to ask, what, did you, I, I understood you were saying this. Was, did I understand that right? Um, ask questions, and then a follow-up question, and then a follow-up question. And then once you have the territory laid out in front of you, then um, register your concern and make sure, or, or make sure if you've accompanied your friend to that, that place, to, make, to give them the moral support they need in order to talk to the person, then just pray for them while they're presenting their concern. Another question? Um, I'm sure most of us know that we have a dress code here, but could you explain to all of us why it is that we dress the way we do? Because you look so sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Makes us happy looking at how she, Makes us happy looking at how sharp you look. Um, the, the, reason, the reason for the dress code is that lack of discipline um, is contagious. Right? And in police work, it's called the, uh, the, uh, the broken window approach to policing. Um, in, uh, let's say there's an urban area, and if petty crime, uh, like the subway turnstile jumping or, or broken windows are just unaddressed, Everything deteriorates. The major crime, everything starts falling apart. And uh, discipline is contagious. So if you require uh, discipline in different areas, it carries over into other areas. So, and everybody, under, everybody understands this. If we were talking about, um, uh, I don't know, homeschool basketball team. If, if you had a homeschool basketball team and the coach said, Oh, just wear whatever, you know, whatever old gym shorts you can find around your house. Everybody would be really upset because they understand that the way the team dresses is related to how the team practices, which is related to how the team plays and, and so on. So being precise and focused and disciplined in one area is conducive to education. It, it creates an environment in which the learning is, uh, there's less friction in the learning process. There, there's more, um, more ability to take in um, more information. We might have time for one more question. There it is. What do you do uh, with coworkers who accuse you of being homophobic or racist right when you walk through the door? Okay, so I, I would encourage you to um, swallow the reductio and, and go right to the heart of the issue. Say, and say something like, what's wrong with that? Well, is there, are, and just turn the question around. Are you saying that there's a standard overarching all of us that all of us have to obey? And this moral standard, where does, where does this moral standard come from? Thou shalt not be homophobic. Thou shalt not be racist. Who says? The basic apologetic approach um, of Christian apologetics can be boiled down to two questions that, are, that every third grader on the playground knows. And that is why and who says. Don't be homophobic. Why? Who says? Give me an account for this. Basically, the secularists who are on a rampage, the, the secularist jihadis are fundamentalists without a fundament. They, they, they don't... They, they, they apply all these harsh, demanding, no compromise moral standards to you. And then they say, and there's no compromise on these. And you should say, why, should, why can't I compromise on these? What's wrong with these things? 
And I'll, I'll finish with a story. Uh, this was when I was at the U of I, the Land of Knowledge. And um, I was in a class one time, and uh, which is what happens when you go to college. And, <laughs> and a discussion broke out about Christianity and impact on the world. And, uh, and some, one of the, there was a girl in there, and her name was Betsy. And she wheeled on, on me in the class and said, you Christians are just like the Nazis. You're so cocksure, you're right about everything. You fill the earth with wars. You make me sick. And in the class, I said, well, Betsy, the only way you could get me to go fight Nazis is if I was sure they were wrong. And I can't be sure they're wrong unless I'm sure of what the truth is. That was in the class. Then after the class, I knew she was a feminist. And after the class, we were talking outside the classroom. And I said, Betsy, what's wrong with oppressing women? Why is that wrong? And she was very intelligent, very bright, and she saw immediately where I was going. And she said, I, I happen to oppose it as a matter of personal preference. Because as soon as she said, it's absolutely wrong, I would say, why, who says? Right? She knew that. So she said, I'm against it as a matter of personal preference. And I said, okay, this is really curious. I'm a, I'm a conservative evangelical Christian. I, I, I believe everything the Apostle Paul ever wrote about headship and submission in marriage. I'm a patriarchal Christian. And I can say that to mistreat women is a sin. God hates it. He hates it in every culture. He hates it every day of the week. And he is going to bring severe judgment down upon it on the last day of the world. And you're a feminist, and you can only say, I don't like it. Right? You'd, but the, you've reduced it, oh feminist, to he, he likes uh, grape nuts. You don't like grape nuts. That's, that's, your more, that's the level of your moral commitment. And so when people accuse you of misogyny or you know, rape apologist or all the awful things, they're trying to get voltage out of the power of the word. The, the, that, that word is a battery. Um, well, not a battery. It's a dead battery, and it's not hooked up to anything. There's, there's no voltage in it. And all you have to do is say, you, you've got this scary-looking battery here. Let me lick it and touch it. Um, they, they say, you're a racist. And you say, what's wrong with that? There is no God. What's wrong with that? You're homophobic. There is no God. Who cares? 500 years from now, who, is anybody going to care if I was misogynistic or racist or homophobic? No. Imagine there's no heaven, as John Lennon taught us. No hell below us. Above Buchenwald, only sky. Above every homophobic act, only sky. The universe doesn't care about your homophobia. The universe doesn't care about your racism. The universe doesn't care. God the Father does care. And can I share the gospel with you? I would just go straight up the middle. Thank you, Pastor Wilson.